Hello and welcome to the Political History of the United States, Episode 3.24, The Six Nations of the Iroquois. Last time when we had left off, we had finished talking about King George's Wars. These wars had been the dominant political feature of the early 1740s and would see fighting both in the northern colonies and down in the south. However, following the end of that conflict, little actually got resolved. The Treaty of Aix-la-Chapelle had virtually ignored the American colonists and had returned the warring factions to a state of status quo antebellum. We have talked about three different wars now between the British and the French. There was King William's War when William Phipps had his failed expedition to Quebec. We had Queen Anne's War with yet another failed expedition to Quebec. Then, of course, we had our last episode when we saw the colonists seize Louisbourg before the Treaty of Aix-la-Chapelle undid all of their hard work. Suddenly, we again find ourselves on the brink of another war between the British and the French, and this time it is going to be a doozy. This episode is going to mark the first in a series of episodes on the French and Indian War, a series that will take up much of the rest of this year. Now, on its surface, this is simply a fourth war in the past 60 years between Britain and France. However, that outlook undermines the fact that this was indeed a different beast entirely. King William's War, Queen Anne's War, and King George's Wars were all European affairs with colonial theaters. King George's War was part of the War of Austrian Succession. Queen Anne's War was part of the War of Spanish Succession. Though King William's War was fought in the colonies, it still had unquestionable relations to affairs back in Europe. King William's War was a European war that just so happened to take place within the colonies. The French and Indian War, however, is different. It is a distinctly colonial war. Sure, it would expand outward and involve Europe back on the continent, eventually becoming the Seven Years' War. But the opening salvo of the conflict came in North America. Rather than simply being a minor theater in a larger conflict, North America would prove to be a major front of the war. This is going to have absolutely huge ramifications moving forward, and in the decade following the war, it is going to push that question of the colony's role in the greater British Empire sharply back into focus. Of course, we know how the story is going to go moving forward. And we know that this time, that question is going to literally bend the relationship between the colonies and the British past the breaking point. However, that is still in our future. The French and Indian War is going to prove to be an absolutely critical moment for the colonies and would have gigantic repercussions. We are going to see names that are synonymous with the American Revolution appear during this war. We are going to see the colonies begin to reconsider their relationships with each other and exactly what that means. However, before we can do any of that, we need to look at the causes of the war. The causes of the French and Indian War are certainly complex, and it will take more than just one episode to fully understand them. However, for this week, I want to begin by looking at a group that had become something of a middleman between our two major colonial powers. For decades, the Six Nations of the Iroquois have been walking a tightrope between the British and the French. This week, I want to dive in and explore that tenuous situation that the Six Nations found themselves in, and look at how the entire thing was about to collapse. The Six Nations of the Iroquois first entered our story back during Bacon's Rebellion. The Iroquois had been fighting with the Susquehanna tribe, pushing them further to the south. This leads to the confrontation with John Washington and his men, which resulted in the Susquehanna representatives being ambushed. During King Philip's War, it was the Iroquois nation, specifically the Mohawk, that delivered the devastating blow to Philip's army. Throughout the 18th century, the Iroquois had found themselves stuck between contentious rivals with the British and the French. What makes the Iroquois such an important player in this story is just how powerful they actually were. Rather than being a single tribe, The Six Nations were a large entity that carried with them real political power. What made the Iroquois so critical is that both the French and the British were reliant on the alliances with them. This made them a highly sought-after entity and meant that they had real power 
not just among other native tribes in the region, but indeed with the British and the French. By this point, the Iroquois had learned the dangers of such deals and therefore clung to a carefully curated neutrality, whereby they attempted an always dangerous game of playing the two sides off of each other. So our question therefore is, why were the Iroquois such a critical piece of the puzzle? What was it about them that made them such an important ally to both the British and the French and thrust them into the middle of multiple wars? Who exactly were the Iroquois? As you have probably surmised from the fact that they are referred to as the Six Nations, the Iroquois were a confederacy of tribes made up primarily of the Onondaga, Cayuga, Sienica, Tuscarora, Mohawk, and Oneida. The Tuscarora joined the confederacy in 1722, and prior to that they had been known as the Five Nations. The information we have regarding the history of the Iroquois traces back to a unifying pact. It is not exactly clear when this pact was formed. However, it is thought to have been some time between the middle part of the 15th century and the early 16th century. These tribes had been longtime rivals, and warfare between them was frequent and often brutal. Tradition says that the prophet, Diyanawida, along with his disciple-in-chief, Hiawatha, came bringing a new message of peace and unity. Diganawida preached that the tribes should end the violence between them and unify in peace. The original five nations agreed to follow this path and formed what would become known as the Great League of Peace and Power. The five nations of the Iroquois had officially been born. The belief of this newly formed confederacy was that it was their job to help spread the good news of peace and power. Spreading the good news meant taking tribes under their wing that wished to take part in this new world order. It likewise meant that anybody less enthusiastic about joining up and becoming an allied tribe was an enemy that could only be dealt with through war, hence the power portion of peace and power. It is important to note here that war was not seen as something that was optional either. Rather, it was the duty of the member tribes to fight that war in order to help open the eyes of the reluctant tribes to the possibilities of unity and peace. This, of course, means that despite preaching a message of unity and peace, the Iroquois nations were frequently at war. As a result of these frequent wars, a strong warrior culture would emerge and would come to help define the Confederacy. Before going too far here, I want to be totally clear that while there was a high level of cooperation between the tribes, especially in matters of war, the individual tribes kept their independence. It absolutely was a confederacy of tribes. These tribes traded together and went to war together. Most critically, the structure of the confederacy was in place to ensure that the member tribes did not go to war with each other. However, there was never any kind of centralized government between the tribes. Well, there were regular meetings taking place between the leadership of each individual tribe, these gatherings were not akin to some great assembly of member nations, but was more a gathering to ensure that the tribes themselves were all on the same page. Remember, the core tenant of the Confederacy was preventing internal warfare, and the annual meetings were designed around achieving that end. Pragmatically, what this means for the greater North American sphere is that the Iroquois diplomatically were not necessarily a unified group. Rather, the individual members continued to have their own preferences for which European power, either the French or the English, that they wished to support. An example of this fact is that the Mohawks tended to ally themselves with the British, while the Senecas more often turned towards French alliances. This means that internally, when either side was seeking a greater alliance with the entire Iroquois nation, there was going to be nothing resembling an overall group consensus on which side to align themselves with. Further exacerbating this problem is that for the group who so loudly preached peace and unity, they sure had done a lot of fighting. By the time that the European influence had really begun expanding through North America in the latter half of the 1600s, the Iroquois were exhausted from over a century's worth of fighting and warfare. Especially concerning for the Iroquois is that in 1664, the Dutch lost control of New Netherland to the English. The Dutch had few scruples about selling guns and ammunition to the Iroquois. Unfortunately for the Iroquois, however, the English have much larger objections to the practice. 
with the flow of weapons from the Dutch cut off by the English, who themselves showed zero interest initially in selling arms to the member nations, the Iroquois were forced to turn to the French. The French, recognizing that they had an opportunity, quickly made peace with the Five Nations and became their chief arms dealer. We have discussed before that always the real hesitation when trading weapons is the fact that there is always a non-zero chance that the weapon that you are selling is eventually going to be used against you. For New France, however, this was a risk that they were willing to take, knowing, or at least hoping, that there was a pretty good chance that at some point, the weapons would be used against their rivals on the English side. Well, the French were the primary arms dealer, and the English were, at least on paper, opposed to arming the Iroquois, in reality, the situation is much different. Let's look back for a moment at King Philip's War, and specifically something that we had talked about back in episode 2.17. In 1676, Medicom and his warriors were hanging out in upstate New York, preparing for the spring campaign season. Our old friend and the New York royal governor, Edmund Andros, was not particularly thrilled about this development. Andros, desperate to fix the problem without getting himself drug into the greater conflict, solicited the Mohawk tribe, a traditional enemy of Metacom's Wampanoag. The Mohawk are, as we have discussed today, one of those five nations. The price to pay for Mohawk involvement was that Andros was going to be the one who had to bring the firepower. Edmund Andros is the one who would arm the Mohawk for this fight. This is something that Andros immediately recognized that he may eventually regret. Of course, we know in hindsight that in this situation, everything worked out well for Andros. The Mohawk devastated Metacom and his men. It was a loss that he personally would never fully recover from and marked a distinct turning point in a war effort that had to that point been rather lackluster. It also shows that despite the official company line of the English of not wanting to trade arms, it clearly was not a policy totally set in stone. Andrus was about as much of a company guy as you could hope for, yet he felt comfortable enough working out a trade with the Mohawk for weapons. Either way, firepower and ammunition was finding its way into the hands of the Iroquois. It is also around this time that the Iroquois Great League meetings, those annual convergences of the groups that we talked about a moment ago, did in fact become more political. The Iroquois had recognized by this point that they were increasingly finding themselves in the middle of a powder keg between the French and the English. At approximately the same time, both the French and the English would realize the importance of the Iroquois and would begin to openly court them. This caused the Five Nations to become more diplomatically tied to one another, as the greater group attempted to play the game between the two European powers. With their position between the French and the English, the Iroquois found that they were now required to tow a very careful line. Interestingly, in the waning years of the 17th century, you see the Iroquois becoming increasingly dependent upon their European neighbors. As was par for the course by this point, Closer contact with the colonists meant that the member tribes were devastated by disease and illness. This is, of course, nothing new. We have seen throughout this entire podcast the health effect that colonists would have on the native tribes as European diseases ran rampant through a population with absolutely no immunity. In addition to that, the native tribes also began to adopt different aspects of the culture. Religion was one of these key places as French Jesuits had some success in converting the local populations amongst the Iroquois nation. Conversion, one combined with a high death toll because of disease and decades of warfare, meant that the population of the Iroquois was likely decreasing. I say likely because I have seen population estimates all over the place for the 18th century. Furthermore, none of the estimates I see really give me any kind of a year, rather just mention the very general ranges of time. However, the sources seem pretty universal in stating that the population of the Iroquois was declining by 1700. The Iroquois, by the turn of the 18th century, had also become far more dependent on European technology. We have already talked today about the role that weapons were now playing when it came to the tribal decision-making process. 
It was the fall of the Dutch in New York that pushed them initially to ally themselves with the French. It was a simple process as the French were willing to supply the arms that the English were not. This dependence, however, became a serious problem for the tribes. Guns had replaced bows and arrows. Native Americans were wearing European clothing as opposed to their more traditional skins. European tools were being used in everyday activities. These practices were dangerous because the Iroquois were now increasingly reliant on the Europeans. Making matters worse is that, as a group, the tribes were slow to adapt the manufacturing and servicing processes. Regarding firearms, the Iroquois were not only dependent on the European nations to supply them with guns, but they required them to help repair them when they broke. For the Iroquois, this represented a very serious risk to their sovereignty. If they decided that they no longer wanted to go along with either the French or the English, they risked being cut off from the technological innovations that they had become reliant upon, yet were not self-sufficient in producing themselves. A final problem would also emerge around this time. Colonial expansion had taken a toll on the Iroquois' hunting grounds. Specifically, as the colonies grew, there was less and less game available to catch. Well, starvation would be the obvious side effect of a serious enough lack of game, that does not seem to be the exact problem here. Rather, the Iroquois had been serious traders in the game market. European colonists needed to eat, and for a long while, game itself had proved to be a valuable commodity. With a reduction in the game trade, however, it marked another serious blow, this time economically, to the Iroquois who were already reeling from nearly half a century of decline. With the Iroquois being in decline by the beginning of the 18th century, the question becomes, what did they have going for them? As much as this episode has been doom and gloom so far, not all was totally lost for the Iroquois Confederacy. It is the same factors leading to their decline that would also prove to be the thing propping them up come 1700. The five nations were located in the right place at the right time. They still had a significant population. They possessed a significant number of guns, thanks to the help of both the French and, though to a lesser extent, the English. For the Iroquois, they were absolutely cognizant of the dangerous game that they were playing. Their real, meaningful power at this point was that they often acted as a wedge between two often hostile groups in the French and the English. The Iroquois, despite being weaker than before, still could prove to be a serious problem to either of the European powers should they decide to pick sides. Nobody wanted the Iroquois attacking them. This means that for both the French and the English, alliances with the tribes were a critical check on the power of either side. At a minimum, the Iroquois acted as a serious deterrent against future hostilities. The Iroquois, however, were not ignorant of the serious dangers that came along with aligning themselves too closely with either European power. One only needs to look to New England to ascertain how all the native tribes were treated in the aftermath of King Philip's War. There, the treatment of the tribes ranged from bad to terrible, depending on what side of the war you fought on. If you fought alongside the colonists, you were likely still looking at having your land reduced and often your people relocated. Occasionally, the colonists would just ignore that you fought with them, and in those instances, you were likely treated the same as the losing side. For the side that lost the war, the outcomes were horrific. Following King Philip's war, thousands were moved or sold into slavery. The Iroquois, therefore, had zero interest in being on the wrong side of a conflict. The best thing that they could do is to play the two sides off of each other, while themselves attempting to maintain a strict neutrality. By the time that we reach Queen Anne's War, we see the Iroquois doing everything they could to remain out of the greater conflict. This policy of strict neutrality is a trend that had been going on for years. Following the initial treaty with the French following the Anglo-Dutch War, we saw the Iroquois at that point building a complex series of relations that have their alliances shifting back and forth during that period prior to 1700. The agreement between the Mohawk and Andrus during King Philip's War being a key example of this. Now, internally, all of this was becoming a very big problem for the Iroquois. 
the shifting series of alliances caused factions to form. Primarily, there were three factions. You had those for the English, those for the French, and those for neutrality. These factions would cause serious internal stress before the neutral faction emerged victorious during the first decades of the 18th century. Neither the French nor the English could risk alienating the Iroquois, and therefore were forced to accept, begrudgingly, a complicated neutrality. Of course, this does not mean that the Iroquois were suddenly no longer players in events. On the contrary, they continued to work hard to play the two sides off of each other. This meant a couple of critical things for the Iroquois. Chiefly, neutrality gave the five, and later six nations, a break from the constant cycle of warfare, and it gave them a real chance to begin to recover their numbers. The French and the English were not very eager to shift Iroquois allegiance over to the other side, which had the added benefit that it would help to protect Iroquois land for much of the first half of the 18th century. Now, I'm not going to talk about it this week, but this system allowed the Iroquois to become a major player in the Ohio Valley. It was indeed the Ohio Valley that is so critical to the coming French and Indian War. I'm going to leave it at that for this week. However, keep this topic in mind. Our next episode is going to be almost completely on the Ohio Valley and why just about everybody was interested in controlling it. Although the neutrality allowed the Iroquois to stabilize towards the beginning of the 18th century, the Confederacy was still at a rough spot. In 1722, the Tuscarora joined the Confederacy, thus turning the Five Nations into the Six Nations. However, despite having a new core member, there were still serious problems. A disastrous land sale known as the walking purchase between the Delaware and the Pens occurred and would bring long-lasting effects that we are going to keep coming back to in the weeks and months to come. If you will recall from our episode on the first decade in Pennsylvania, specifically episode 2.20, William Penn had gone out of his way to protect Delaware settlements along the frontier of Pennsylvania. At the time, the point of the settlement was to provide a buffer. For Penn, the advantage was that should there be an attack along the frontier, it would be the Delaware tribe, and not the Pennsylvania colonists, getting the surprise. William Penn wanted to ensure that he maintained good relations with the local tribes, and therefore with any land deal that he reached between them, he did all he could to ensure that they were fairly made. The Quakers respected the rights and traditions of the Delaware people, and the Delaware were likewise more than happy to strike trade deals with the Pennsylvania colonists and even occasionally sell their land to those colonists. By the time that the 1730s rolled around, a lot had changed. The Delaware had become a client of the Iroquois, and on the colonist side, William Penn had died. Unfortunately for the Delaware people, Penn's sons, Thomas and John, were far less concerned with the rights of the local tribes. For the Pens and their followers, their primary goal was not to build a Quaker haven or some kind of grand experiment. Rather, their goal was to make a more profitable colony. During the 18th century, the best shot of making a great profit came from the increased number of Irish and German immigrants coming into the colony. Pennsylvania had no headright system. Their greatest asset was their land. With this influx of immigrants into the region, the Pens desperately wanted to free up some land to sell to the newest settlers. The Delaware, who were not interested in selling their land, would soon be involved in one of the single strangest moments in American history. In 1735, Thomas Penn claimed that he had discovered an old deed from his father. However, this was no ordinary deed. Rather, it was a walking deed. Okay, so what is a walking deed? Well, I'm glad you asked. A walking deed is a deed that granted a man all the land in an area as far as he could walk in a day and a half. Penn got himself a contingent of relay runners and had them set off to map out the actual boundaries of their claim. Unsurprisingly, the Delaware were very quick to scream foul. Pragmatically, however, they only numbered about 4,000 at this point. They had expansive holdings with a limited warrior class. Pennsylvania had become less dominated by Quakers, though they were still a large faction, which means that there were less overall pacifists within the colony. 
Practically, the Delaware simply lacked the strength to hold the land by themselves, despite being well aware of the fact that they were being cheated. However, the Delaware had a trump card, or so they thought. As I said a moment ago, they were a client of the Iroquois, who, despite being in decline, were still a far more formidable power than the Delaware were themselves. So the Iroquois jump in here and save the day, right? Well, no. The problem is that Thomas and John Penn had always recognized the power of the Iroquois. They knew the Delaware would turn to them and that the smart move was to get to the Iroquois first. The Penns and the Iroquois, as it turned out, made for pretty good bedfellows in this case, as both groups had some mutual needs. Pennsylvania wanted to open up trade with the Western tribes and needed those pathways opened by the Iroquois, who were perfectly positioned to potentially interfere and block any such trade. For the Iroquois, they would improve their relations with Pennsylvania, hence hopefully opening up additional paths of trade with the colony. They likewise viewed subjugating the Delaware as a method whereby they could further extend their own influence and power. With the Delaware removed from eastern Pennsylvania, it would put the Iroquois themselves in a more advantageous position to deal directly with the colonists. It further meant that the Iroquois had now firmly asserted themselves as the ultimate arbitrator of Indian lands in the region. In 1742, the Iroquois went ahead and approved the move by Pennsylvania and ordered the Delaware to relocate to the Susquehanna River. Many of the Delaware were not interested in doing this at all, and thus just kept moving west, pouring into the increasingly important Ohio country. This mass exodus had an interesting effect. Despite on paper the Delaware being a client of the Iroquois, the members of the tribe hated their guts. As they poured into the Ohio Valley and often joined with the eastern branches of the Shawnees, it caused an erosion of Iroquois power and influence over the Ohio country. So many of the tribes coming into the region were doing so because of the actions of the Iroquois, which had necessitated these moves in the first place. The problem, however, for the Iroquois ran even deeper than having tribes in the Ohio wanting revenge against them. Two years later, in 1744, during negotiations for the Treaty of Lancaster, the Iroquois agreed that they would respect the original claims of Maryland and, more importantly, Virginia. Now, the Iroquois believed that the practical effect of this treaty is that they were simply giving up their claims over the Shenandoah Valley, that area along the Shenandoah River up in the northwestern portion of the colony, largely in what is modern-day West Virginia. The problem was, nobody had mentioned it to the Iroquois that the Virginia boundaries that they were claiming extended far beyond just the Shenandoah Valley, but rather were absurdly large. Seriously, the original claim by Virginia extended all the way out to the Pacific Ocean, and specifically includes California. To the north, the claim extends all the way up to the western portions of Hudson Bay. So, you know, they pretty much claimed like half the current continental United States. Virginia knew that a whole lot of the claim was now taken from other colonies, and there wasn't much they could do there, nor were they even particularly motivated to do anything at all. Likewise, they were not seriously looking at setting up shop out on the west coast. What was convenient for them is that the Iroquois had just ceded lands within that region, which incidentally includes the Ohio country, which the Iroquois were so desperate to retain, and that the Virginians were so eager to control. We will talk more about this next time when we look more closely at the Ohio Valley. At the same time that this was going on, internal fractures in the Confederacy were forming. During King George's Wars in the 1740s, the Mohawk openly broke with the established Iroquois neutrality and allied themselves with New York. This would prove to be an absolutely catastrophic decision. First, New York was not really interested in a fight. King George's War was, as we discussed last time, something that primarily involved the New England colonies, at least so far as we are concerned this week. The Mohawk would build a few forts and made a few raids into French Canada, even as the New York merchants led by James DeLancey and Governor George Clinton, continued to trade with the French during the war. As business continued, the Mohawk continued to fight a war, despite being largely undercut by the very group requesting their help in New York. In 
to further add fuel to the fire. The Mohawk not falling into line with the Six Nations at large was a serious blow to the stability and cohesion of the Six Nations of the Iroquois. At a time of already diminishing influence, the Mohawk had just seriously disrupted the unity of the Iroquois, which would help to further reduce the Iroquois' influence in the Ohio country. New York's decision not to really back up the Mohawk, despite requesting their help and in fact continuing the fur trade with the French, planted deep seeds of mistrust between the Mohawk and the British. It likewise meant at the end of the day that the Mohawk had literally nothing to show for their alliance with the British. By the end of King George's War, the Iroquois had undeniably entered a period of significant decline. However, just because they are in decline does not mean that they had become irrelevant. As we are going to see in the coming weeks, the Iroquois are still very much a player in the great game. Next time, we are going to turn our attention to the Ohio country and why it is so important. We will examine who was already there, who controlled it, and how it was changing. Until then, I hope you all have a wonderful two weeks. I hope that you are staying healthy and staying safe. And I will see you back here next time as we discuss the Ohio country. <laughs> <laughs>